My name is Anjum Rajabali and I am the general and the honorary secretary of the Dr. Ashok Dar Anade Memorial Trust. And it is today my privilege to welcome all of you on behalf of Dr. Ashok Dar Anade Memorial Trust to this 10th Dr. Ashok Dar Anade Memorial Lecture. As the number suggests, uh, since 2011, in memory of Dr. Ranade, who we lost uh, in a very untimely way, truly in a heartbreakingly untimely way, in July 2011. So in his memory, the Trust has been organizing various activities to further his work. One of the regular initiatives has been this annual memorial lecture, and this is the 10th one which we are holding. It is indeed our honor, our privilege that this time we have Dr. Catherine Butler Schofield, who is an eminent, knowledgeable, and academically extremely passionate scholar about the subject that she is going to outline here. And she has a formidable reputation in the world of musicology and music scholarship. So we're all eagerly waiting to hear her. The Ashok Dar Anade Memorial Trust was established in 2013 and uh, its primary objective is actually to disseminate and further the work that Dr. Anade left behind. He was the author of 24 books, each one of a high scholarly caliber, but at the same time they were an equal number of books that were left unfinished unfortunately because he didn't anticipate his own passing on. Apart from that there's an enormous amount of work that he has done in the form of notes, research, various ideas, proposals, various initiatives that he has actually put down which he wanted to take forward. The trust has taken it upon itself to ensure that all these subjects which is a wide spectrum that he was engaged in and which had his lasting influence, it is the trust's objective to actually try and disseminate those and take it further. The range of interests which Dr. Pradhan is going to speak about when he introduces Dr. Ranade in a more extensive way, actually is a, the range of interests is very, very wide, ranging from music, music performance, musicology, theater, other performing arts, and almost every field of culture and arts. And each one left a very lasting and scholarly stamp of his. Before I finish, uh, since we do have a lot of interested people here, I would like to announce that the Dr. Ashok Dar Under Memorial Trust is looking forward to continuously receiving proposals and ideas from others, whether it is in the form of any research work, any kind of documentation, or organizing of events, seminars, conferences, etc., or even fellowships and scholarships that people would be needing to take this any subject from amongst this wide range forward. So please don't hesitate to approach us. The uh, address, email address is given uh, on the announcement, is it? If it is not, I'm just going to put it on the chat. So just in case you people need to, anybody wants to reach out or you can inform your friends and other colleagues to do that. Yeah. Now, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Anish Pradhan, who is an eminent musician and a music scholar in his own right, and who is also the chairperson of our trust. Anish, please. Namaskar, uh, everyone, and once again, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, many of you are aware about Dr. Ashok Ranade's contribution to music, to theater, to criticism, to cinema, to scholarship, and to the lives of his students, colleagues, and everyone who had the good fortune to have interacted with him. Those who have some familiarity with his work will know that it is an impossible task to speak about all of it given its enormity. So out of necessity, I'm going to emphasize some essential features of its philosophy, which have impacted the study of Indian music in an indelibly 
significant manner, especially in the fields of musicology, pedagogy, and composition. Acknowledging the complex and heterogeneous nature of Indian music, Dr. Ranade vigorously attacked preconceived hierarchies and barriers within musical categories and genres. Being more, being more than acutely aware of the multiplicity of categories, systems, and genres of music in India, he stressed the need to examine non-elite musical categories and regional musicological literature, along with Sanskrit Sangeet Shastras, to gain a holistic picture of Indian music and musicology. Dr. Ranade's proclivity for codification, categorization, and definition has given us a vocabulary that has become integral to the discourse on Indian music. From among the more than 20 books that he wrote on music, I'm singling out one, Music Context, a concise dictionary of Hindustani music, which is emblematic of his rigorous pursuit of the nuances of the performing and scholastic traditions. Among other things, it demystifies North Indian music, steering clear of the conventional adjectival approach that most other endeavors adopt. As a teacher, he ensured that his knowledge was freely available to students. As the first director of the University Music Center at Bombay University, he brought together elements of the Guru Shishya tradition and modern institutionalized education. Dr. Ranade's compositions for Khayal, Launi, Bhajan, and other forms, and his theater and film work all bore his stamp of individuality. Incisive and precise, analytical and informative, witty and thought provoking, Dr. Ranade was a master at making the most complex of concepts sound simple and tangible through his lectures. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to formally introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Catherine Butler Schofield is a historian of music in Mughal and early colonial India, based at King's College London, where she is senior lecturer in South Asian music and history. Working largely with Persian and Urdu sources, circa 1570 to 1860, through stories about alluring courtesans, legendary ustads, and captivated patrons, she writes on sovereignty and selfhood, affection and desire, sympathy and loss, and power worldly and strange. Dr. Schofield is the co-editor of two volumes of essays, Monsoon Feelings, A History of Emotions in the Rain, with Imke Rajamani, and Margaret Pernon. I hope I am pronouncing those names correctly. And Tellings and Texts, Music, Literature, and Performance in North India with Francesca Orsini. I highly recommend these works. Uh, we have uh, gone through these in great detail. So uh, do get your copies. Uh, her last, her latest book, uh, music and Musicians in Late Mughal India, Histories of the Ephemeral, 1748 to 1858, will be out with Cambridge University Press in 2022. And we are all eagerly awaiting the publication. Uh, Dr. Schofield is a keen podcaster, and you can listen to her Histories of the Ephemeral series wherever you get your podcasts. In 2014, Dr. Schofield was awarded the Music Forum Award in India for her contribution to the cause of Indian music. With that, I would now like to invite Dr. Schofield to deliver the 10th Dr. Ashok Ranade Memorial Lecture. Thank you, G. Namaskar, Adab. Hello to everybody. Um, it is an enormous pleasure and a privilege to have been invited to deliver the 10th 
Dr. Ashok Da Ranade Memorial Lecture. Um, thank you so much to the Trust and to the organizers. Thank you to all of you uh, for being here. Um, and I'm going to dedicate my, uh, my lecture today to three musicians from Afghanistan um, who um, are suffering very greatly from the silencing of their music uh, at the moment. Um, and they are M, M and W. Um, and I hope at some point they will get the chance to, to see this. Um, it's a, an especial privilege to, to deliver this lecture because Dr. Ranade was not merely um, an extremely great musicologist, musical philosopher, music historian, but he was also an extremely nice man. Um, I met him once and he was incredibly kind to me as a young scholar. Um, and um, it is a delight to speak in his honor today. So without any further ado, uh, let me begin with an old story. The illiterate Ustad and other myths writing on music in the late Mughal world. In 1908, two very different scholars of Hindustani music met at the confluence of the Ganga and Jamna rivers. One of these men, Karamatullah Khan, was a Muslim Ustad belonging to the Gharana of Basit Khan Galawant, who had been Rabab player and Ustad to the last king of Lucknow, Vajdalisha. The other was a middle-class Western educated Maratha Brahmin called Vishnu Narayan Patkande, now known as the father of Hindustani musical modernity. Patkande had arrived in Allahabad on the very last leg of his tour of India, conducting research for what he hoped would be a comprehensive history, reconnecting contemporary Hindustani music decisively with its Sanskrit theoretical roots as part of his project of reforming music into something suitable for a public national platform. It was Karamatullah, though, who sought Patkande out in Janiki Buckley's retelling in order to give him a book, a copy of his own recent 300-page publication on the history and theory of Hindustani music. This meeting did not go well. What could have been a historically decisive moment was diverted into a farcical cul-de-sac of absurd misunderstandings and wasted opportunity, thanks to Bhatkande's blinkered view of hereditary musicians. After presenting his book, Karamatullah tried to engage Bhatkande in a musicological discussion between equals on an obscure point of Sanskrit theory. Bhatkande was having none of it. By and large, he wrote in his diary of this meeting, I don't like discussing music with professional musicians. They know little, but like to fight a lot. They spend a little time with us, learn just a little from us, and then say, they've known this all along. Reading between the lines of Pat Kandy's somewhat self-serving recollections, it seems he deliberately tried to pick a fight with Karamatullah in this conversation, setting him up as his favorite straw man, the and I quote, illiterate, ignorant, and narrow-minded hereditary musician, in order to knock him down as a fabulist who possessed just enough garbled Shastric knowledge, presumably handed down through some dubious oral means, to disfigure it beyond recognition. Bhat Kande was a far more complex and interesting figure than has recently been painted. And generally, I feel he has been much misunderstood. I need to make that clear. But on this point, the supposedly arrogant, ignorant Ustad, he was indeed implacably prejudiced. More recent scholarship has been much kinder to hereditary musicians and to non-written oral and oral modes of transmitting traditional knowledge that Bad Kande was. But Bhatkande's assertion that the Ustads of Hindustan were illiterate has stuck and remains the standard in our histories. My simple aim this evening is to reassess what we think we know about the nature of the Ustads traditions and their relationship with written modes of preserving musical knowledge. I'm going to do so by sharing with you a range of musical literature written 
by Ustads and their disciples in the late Mughal period, roughly from the mid 17th until the 19th century, mostly in Persian, but some in Bridge Pasha. One of the things that Dr. Ranade was very keen on was the relationship between the arts. And so tonight I thought I would bring in some painting. And of course, we're talking about music and literature. In the intelligence of tradition in Rajput court painting, Molly Aitken challenges some of our fundamental assumptions about the nature of tradition in the work of hereditary painters who were patronized by the Maharanas of Udaipur or Mewar from the 16th century until the present day. In the last paragraph of her introduction, she pays tribute to her own painting master, Bannu, who, and I quote, asked for no remuneration and opened his house and family to me as if I were his daughter. Such generosity was his custom, for as he explained to me, he took apprentices out of responsibility to the art. In some curious way, I have come to understand my book as a tribute to Banu's silence. His profound knowledge of Mughal and Rajput styles was not verbal. And so Banu never explained what he taught, rather he taught by example. Thus, I understand my own text ultimately to arrive at the threshold of what I suspect was often like Banu's the deeply silent knowledge of painters. And those of us familiar with the world of Hindustani music will recognize much in this that resonates with the traditional picture of the hereditary Muslim musicians or ustads who carried many of the elite musical traditions of the Mughal court in Delhi faithfully through invasions, dispersals, colonization, impoverishment, all out war and devastation safely through to the modern age. Like Udaipur's painters, Delhi's ustads taught by practical and largely not written means. According to Dart Newman, Dan Newman's son, they made students practice rags which, without telling them the rag names and sing notes without singing the note names. Musicians never really explained or theorized their practices. The ustads were masters of an art that was the opposite of silent in its very nature. But when it came to technical explanation of that art in words, the Ustad's knowledge remained like that of the painters, deeply silent. Wordlessness encapsulates what scholars have long considered to be the fundamental nature of traditional forms of knowledge transmission among India's hereditary artisans. Scholars have observed that traditional painters and musicians transmit their knowledge through practice and example without reference to written or sometimes even verbalized explanation. We've noted that mastery for the traditional student takes the form of endless practice, endless repetition, endless wordless internalization of the forms and techniques of the master's example. And from that, we've assumed that the forms of traditional knowledge might be of a different order from quote unquote modern ones that are inherently conscious, rational, verbal, and literate. In fact, theories of modernity tell us that to be modern is fundamentally to recognize the existence of the traditional and to recognize th the traditional as disjunct from the modern. Traditional knowledge is embodied and implicit in the performance of the art. Modern knowledge is articulated explicitly in spoken and written discourse. Traditional knowledge is inarticulate, even when its beauties and virtuosities are publicly and patently manifest. Traditional knowledge is a silent knowledge. It is therefore unsurprising that the encounter of traditional artisans, including musicians with the modern world, and with modern forms of knowledge, such as art history and musicology that would articulate those traditions on their behalf, has historically been a difficult one. At our best, scholars have come to understand that while orally, orally and kinesthetically transmitted systems of knowledge may be configured differently to written systems, they are not a priori inferior to them. <laughs> 
that while their elucidation may require different and highly specialized techniques of study, such as musical or formal artistic analysis, they nonetheless demonstrate comparable levels of cognitive complexity. As Dr. Ranade put it so presciently nearly 40 years ago, and he was such a pioneer in this regard, anthropologists very frequently, in which one should include Western ethnomusicologists, tend to bracket oral tradition with preliterate or folk cultures. It is sheer prejudice to confine possession of culture to the literate or equate the pre-cultured state with the non-literate. A deeper look into the origin, development and function of the oral tradition of Indian music does not allow such a presumption. This should convince us of oral traditions potentialities in contexts that are both modern and sophisticated. Oral tradition is important because there are intrinsic bonds between creativity and oral tradition. But certain problematic notions about traditional artisans have continued to inform art historical and musicological accounts of their work. In art history, Aitken suggests it has customarily been assumed, even if no one would perhaps say so in quite such strong terms, that the master painters of Rajput miniatures were conservative, conventional, passive, unthoughtful, even unintelligent in their approach to their painting, that their silence bespoke a lack of conscious thought or forethought Aitken has comprehensively demonstrated that this was not so, that Mewari artists and their viewers instead enjoyed a high level of knowledge about their art rarely acknowledged today, and that painters worked consciously, not instinctively, that they unmistakably wielded creative intelligence in their choices. The master painters of Mewa may not have articulated what they were doing, but they nonetheless knew what they were doing. Music scholars understanding of the nature of tradition has customarily been slightly different. It's long been recognized, for instance, that the idea that musical pieces have been handed down orally from revered ancestors, unaltered by any intervening human intelligence, is generally a rhetorical device used to justify contemporary acts of individual creativity. The question in music, therefore, has not been one of whether the Ustads, as they embarked on their bruising encounter with reformist musicology at the turn of the 20th century, exercised conscious knowledge, we know that they did, but a question of the relationship of their musical inheritance, which they claimed belonged to the past, to written theoretical discourse, specifically the Sanskrit Sangeeta Shastras, which incontrovertibly belonged to a supposedly Hindu past that musicologists were at the time actively trying to revive. In a nutshell, the issue was not whether the Ustads knew what they were doing, but whether they were literate in ways that mattered to modernity. Bhatkandi's famous address to the first All India Music Conference set out the reformist musicologist's position most succinctly. Hindustani music was in urgent need of rescue and reformation because we all know that theory is the real backbone of practice. And when theory perishes, the practice, though it may continue to live on, is bound ultimately to drift away and run into disorder and confusion. That is exactly what seems to have happened in Northern India. Our old Sanskrit grantas, having thus become inapplicable to the current practice, we naturally have come to be thrown on the mercy of our illiterate, ignorant and narrow-minded professionals. Our modern scholars have distinctly seen the disadvantages of this unsatisfactory state of things, but in the absence of proper help and facilities, they find themselves unable to control the situation at present. The ideological heft of this, illiterate, ignorant, and narrow-minded is hard to miss. The general inability of the Ustads to read or write at all, with the result being moral as well as musical degeneracy, had become a standard topic in public debate by this time. 
But rather than treat what is so obviously ideological with suspicion, music scholars have absorbed its basic underlying thrust that many, if not most of the hereditary Ustads could not read or write. Or if they did possess some measure of functional literacy, they did not use it in teaching, performance, practice or discourse. This is partly because the ethnomusicological pioneers of the 60s and 70s themselves found this to be the case in their anthropological fieldwork on selected Guranas. But it's also because we transformed what had been a cause for contempt, non-written knowledge practices, into a highly evolved and virtuous mechanism of knowledge reproduction that was fundamental to and therefore inseparable from our understanding of the hereditary system. And it absolutely is that. So I'm going to quote from Dan Newman, the seminal Western theorist of lineage in Hindustani music, writing in 1985, to show how he took on board the basic outline of Pat Kandi's story of the failure of Muslim ustads to engage with written theory, but turned it on its head from criticism into approbation of a different way of doing theory embodiment through Silsila. From the Mughal period, professional Muslim musicians did not write theoretical treatises. Indeed, the significance of the kinship or discipula link to Tanzain is related to the fact that for Muslim Hindustani musicians, musical theory was coded in an essentially oral medium, and ultimately authority consequently lay not in quasi-sacred texts as in the South, but in quasi-sacred pedigrees neither prescriptive nor descriptive, musical theory for Muslim musicians was essentially ascriptive. In other words, they were not illiterate, uh, but it was irrelevant to them. The substance of mu Muslim musical theory was never inscribed on paper. It was embedded in memory. It was transmitted through the medium of what theory was thought to be, namely performance, which was learned and memorized by each successive generation. The authority for theoretical assertions thus rested not on theory itself, but in the person who proclaimed it. The sources of a person's authority was dependent on the identity of the person, and that identity was socially defined by his musical pedigree. Musicians who could trace their ancestry to one or more historically important musical figures, a Tansen, a Sadarang, a Husro, were by virtue of such connections accepted as the main carriers of the musical tradition. Muslim scholars who did write on music were members of the nobility, not professional musicians. Indeed, Walter Kaufman claims that many of the great musicians he knew earlier in the century were functionally illiterate. And Dan Newman has actually changed his mind on this. So it's a little unfair to read something that he wrote in 1985, uh, nearly 40 years later. <laughs> this dual notion that the Ustads did not write about music because of their low social position as skilled artisans on the one hand, and secondly, because culturally they developed a different way of expressing and preserving theory through genealogy is still the bedrock of our discussions of theory versus practice kinesthetic versus verbal learning, orality versus literacy in the transmission and performance of the Hindustani musical system. We've become much more flexible and nuanced in our understanding that these are dialectical modes. They don't uh, mutually exclude each other. They're not fixed dichotomies, but even so in 2012, Daniel's son, Dard Newman can still assert with the full weight of scholarship behind him that many musicians were until independence largely illiterate with little formal theoretical knowledge of their music. In the remainder of this lecture, I am simply going to present evidence that several lineages of hereditary Ustads, the chief Galawans to the Mughal emperors in Delhi, as well as a number of Kavals were literate. More than that, these professional practitioners were highly literate in Persian, Hindavi or Brajpasha, Urdu, and sometimes Sanskrit, and Arabic. And they possessed expert knowledge of the canonical written corpus of music theory developed at the 17th century Mughal court from Sanskrit models in both the Persian language and in Pasha. And yet again, 
it was Dr. Ranaday who made two extremely important points before anybody else did in his important 1984 book on music and musicians of Hindustan. Firstly, that oral and literate traditions in Indian music have not historically been in opposition to each other. And secondly, that Hindustani Karana musicians are not, in fact, generally illiterate. Quite often, he wrote, it is incorrectly suggested that the oral tradition rules out the existence of writing and the written by definition. The oral and the written are regarded as mutually exclusive and as a consequence it is erroneously held that the oral tradition necessarily prospers when a writing printing etc are not possible or b when writing is not known to a particular culture. This point of view excludes the possibility of a group's deliberate choice of the oral mode of communication in preference to the written mode, in spite of the fact that the group possesses the requisite knowledge and technique of writing. And more specifically, he noted that the Hindustani oral tradition emphasizes the unwritten, relies on it, but hardly imposes a blanket ban on writing. Hindustani music does accommodate the writing down of composition skeletons. It even encourages writing down of elaboration sketches of certain rags. Tomes comprising these are handed down from generation to generation. The written volumes are carefully preserved and extreme secrecy is maintained about their very existence. Some of the musicians or their favoured disciples are allowed access to these treasures. However, the point is that these documents are regarded as supplementary and are held important only because they facilitate the transmission of the frameworks of knowledge to posterity. Dr. Ranaday was absolutely right on the reasons why Ustad's right to ensure the most vital information survives into the future. But the sheer extent of hereditary Ustad's writing on music in the 17th through 19th centuries, and especially innovative works of music theory would, I think, have surprised even him. So let's turn to those now. Over the past 10 years, in conjunction with a small group of other historians and musicologists and literary specialists, I've been conducting a large scale project on written sources for Hindustani music in the late Mughal world, roughly between 1658 and 1858. My own research on what happened to music as the Mughal Empire gave way to the British East India Company in the last century of that time frame will be published next year by Cambridge University Press as Music and Musicians in Late Mughal India, Histories of the Ephemeral 1748 to 1858. The book takes the stories of nine largely forgotten musicians of the time, including this fine gentleman here, Mian Himmat Khan Kalawant, the last of the direct line of hereditary binkars to the Mughal emperors in Delhi and co-author of an important treatise on Tal, as we'll see, as a way into thinking about six different types of writing on music that arose in the late Mughal period, because it turns out they wrote a lot about music. Of all the arts and sciences in the Mughal world, music was the one they wrote about the most. I also seek to answer the question, why? Why, given they believed it was impossible to capture the essence of music in pen and ink on the surface of a page, why did they write about music so copiously and so often? Well, the archive of writings on Hindustani music for this period is simply enormous. Our Shamsa database, which you can access online open access, includes well over 300 individual works, most of which have been overlooked until now. And these are in several different uh, North Indian vernacular languages and Persian and Sanskrit. So if we survey these musical writings as a whole, it becomes clear that for reasons that are still obscure, in North India only, not anywhere else in India, in North India only, Sanskrit ceased to be a significant medium for musical theoretical writing after about 1700. So that's the beginning of the 18th century. Instead, the legacy of the Sangeeta Shastras was carried over in full into two different linguistic vehicles, Persian and Brajpasha. The Brajpasha musicological traditions, which the amazing Richard David Williams is working on, slightly predate the mid 17th century flourishing of Persian writings on Hindustani music. 
The works I'm going to discuss today are mostly in the Persian tradition because that has been my own life's work. Um, and a quick side note, uh, neither of these languages, Persian or Pasha, were sectarian in the Mughal period. People of all religions wrote in both. Um, and in addition, Pasha was frequently written in the Nastaliq script in this period. Um, it just depended on who your audience was and what script they could read. Um, there was no direct association in this period between script and language or script and religion. And we will see a Pasha uh, treatise in Nastaliq script as we go along. What's more, it has emerged that a number of key ustads with hereditary ties to the central Mughal tradition of elite raga based music in Delhi were integral over several generations in developing and sustaining this Indic Persianate tradition through their own writing of music treatises from about 1600, sorry, 1660 until at least 1915. It's still true to say that most musical treatises between 1600 and 1900 were written by patrons and connoisseurs, not professional practitioners. But beginning with Mir Saleh Kaval Dehlavi's Nishatara in about 1660, and Raspar Khan Kalawant's paraphrased translation of Damodara's Sanskrit Sangita Darpana, the 1698 Shamsalaswat, Hereditary musicians also began to contribute to and innovate significantly within the written theoretical traditions of North Indian classical music. Before turning to the most important and sustained multi-generational effort to preserve musical knowledge and writing, I want to make a quick sidestep to consider two important works written by Kavals. Kavals in the Mughal period were not merely Sufi shrine singers. They were the pr principal performers of khayal at court, which was considered to be the distinctive intellectual property of Kavals, but which they also taught to courtesans and, as is well known, to one young Kalawant, who at the end of the 17th and beginning of the 18th century took khayal, read with it, and made it synonymous with his own name, and that was Niamat Khan Sadarang who was a Kalawant. The first of these texts is Mir Saleh Kaval Dehlavi's Nishatara, which is probably the earliest, I think, uh, systematic Persian treatise on Hindustani music um, of the Mughal court. Contrary to some confusing reports, uh, this is not the same person as the aristocrat Mir Saleh, who was Shah Jahan's chief librarian. Rather, he was memorialized by Saif Khan Fakhrullah, the author of the 1666 Rag Darpan, which uh, the late Shahab Saramadi translated and edited in a fantastic edition, um, as the greatest singer in Delhi. But more importantly, Fakhrullah included a great deal of the information from Mir Saleh's book, especially on the mixed ragas and raganis in his own seminally important music treatise, the Rag Darpan. The second, was written nearly 150 years later and is probably the only Persian treatise to be known by name by most Indian music scholars. And it's the Usul al Nagwat al Asafi. We now have a much more accurate understanding of its date and author. It's not early 19th century as Patkande thought, but about 1790. And it was written by the Qawal Ghulam Raza in Faisabad or Lucknow and dedicated to the Nawab of Lucknow at the time, Asaf ud Dola. Ghulam Raza's father, was the Delhi Kaval, Mian Muhammad Pana, who studied the bean with Mian Anjabaras Khan Kalawant before joining the service of Sadat Ali Khan, Asaf Uddullah's brother and later his successor. Ghulam Raza likewise studied the bean with his father and was employed in Sadat Ali Khan's household. His father's Gurubai, the gentleman amateur musician Ziauddin, remembered Ghulam Raza as wise and clever. And indeed, his music treatise is quite remarkable. It's both fully in dialogue with what had by this time emerged as the mainstream of Hindustani music and the Persian language. It's based on the aforementioned Raspalas Khan Kalawant's Shamsal Aswat. But it is also a genuinely modernizing work. Most remarkably, it's the first to produce a reproducible notation of several rags, complete with pitch, duration, and lyrics, or at least nom-tom syllables, um, as you can see here. 
What is sociologically and musicologically interesting here at this point in the Mughal period is that Ghulam Raza's heritage firstly as a performer and secondly as a theorist plugs him, a Delhi lineage Kawal, firmly into the main literate Kalawan tradition, which I'm going to turn to now. So you can see there the influence of Ras Baras Khan's Shams al uh, on the Usul al Nagmati Asafi and the fact that Ras Baras Khan's son, Mianan Jabaras Khan, taught Ghulam Raza's, Raza's father. Okay. So most crucially, it appears that all of the Kalawan authors that we can trace belonged to one, one might say, the hereditary brotherhood, the joint lineages of Tansain and Sadarang, which was conjoined by the dynastic marriage of Anjabaras Khan to Sadarang's daughter in the mid 18th century, and who served as chief Kalawans to the Mughal emperors all the way down from Akbar to Bahadur Shah Zafar. I call this the Delhi Kalawant Biradari. Through a series of Persian, Prajpasha, and Hindi and Urdu texts, I've now established the genealogy of this lineage, including many of its non-hereditary disciples, plus important branches of the family that migrated elsewhere in the subcontinent all the way down past 1900, though in very curtailed and tangential form after the trauma of 1857. And it's worth noting that this is simply the written lineage. It's as biased as any other kind of lineage that anybody wants to draw. So um, this is not in conflict with any other lineages that uh, you may have seen or, or, or traced. This is simply what is in the written texts over a period of about 150 years. Okay. The high level of this lineage's articulate knowledge should not, frankly, come as a surprise it's now well known, particularly from the work of Nalani Dalvois, that the Kalawans of the Mughal courts were considered Vagayakharas, distinguished poet composers of Drupad songs with highly refined lyrics in the riti or courtly style of Prajapasha. As is clear from Khushal Khan's Anup's vast compendium of songs, compiled between 1818 and 1834, which is called the Rag Ragni Rosa Shab. Members of the Delhi Kalawant Biradari continued to compose in Braj Pasha well into the 19th century. Uh, and of course, song composition continues. Um, of course, song composition does not necessarily indicate written composition, but members of this lineage also wrote musical treatises. So these are some of the ones I've worked on in chronicle or chronological order. The first is the Shamsa Laswat of 1698, written in Persian for Aurangzeb Alamgir by his chief Kalawant Rasbaras Khan, the great great grandson of Tan Sen. And there is an English language translation and critical edition of this published by Medad uh, Falazada um, uh, a few years ago. On the left hand side of the slide is the genealogy from the 1788 Edinburgh Tal treatise of the direct descendants of Tan Sen, Akbar's chief Kalawan, via his son Bilas Khan and Bilas Khan's son-in-law and chief disciple Lal Khan Kalawan Gunasamudra, who was chief musician to Jahangir and Shah Jahan. Lal Khan's son was Khushal Khan, also called Gunasamudra, and chief musician to Shah Jahan and Alamgir. And his son was Ras Baras Khan, who like his father was chief musician to Alamgir. According to his disciples, Ras Baras Khan was a Sufi master as well as the greatest performer of his day. And he was clearly literate in either Sanskrit or Brajpasha because the Shamsa Lasvat is an original translation of Damodara's Sankita Darpana, which enjoyed success at the Mughal court in both its original Sanskrit and its Brajpasha recension by Harivalab although it includes a large number of Rasparas Khan Kalawan's own thoughts and findings. Indeed, due to its adherence to the newly developed Persian epistemology of writing music treatises about Hindustani music, 
and its significant reception history in later centuries, the Shams al Asfat is one of the corpus of 17th century works in Persian on Hindustani music that I refer to as canonical, and we can discuss that more in the Q&A if you like. I've already briefly mentioned uh, the Edinburgh Treatise on Pal of 1788, written in Persian by an unknown member of the Delhi Kalamant Bharadari for an unknown patron, somewhere in North India. Um, apart from including a detailed genealogy of the chief line of Pansen down to the date of writing that's quite patently intended to valorize the author's own lineage, this work is an unprecedented and wholly innovative treatise on the Tal system, which seeks to codify an altered Tal system that was no longer served well by the old Sanskrit notation system, and it draws inspiration from Arabic notation systems for rhythm. And Jim Kippen has recently uh, written a really fantastic chapter on some of these uh, tile treatises that arise in this time. It also includes a section on musical instruments, including a number of European instruments, one of which, the harpsichord, he enthuses about at length. I'm going to give you a long quotation. The Europeans have another instrument of the string family that is extremely fine and noble named the harpsichord. It has 35 fundamental strings, that is a five octave or subtact range measured using the natural or white notes of the keyboard. The music is differentiated into high and low melodies, which those knowledgeable in the science write in books of music. Between the two main melodies, other distributions are also made. And I think this is a, an attempt at describing the use of right and left hands, so treble and bass melodic lines and chordal harmony. This instrument developed from the kanun. Every string has a plectrum, a misrab that is placed parallel to each string. I, the humble drafter of this treatise, composed music in every particular using 19 fundamental strings, seven for the lower subtak, seven for the main subtak, and the remaining five for the upper subtak up to par. One can create sagam for every rag very well on this instrument. When I play the shrutis from the lower sa to upper par in one hand and also play the 61 other strings in the other, greater subtleties are possible. The phrases of druped can be created on this instrument. So we have this harp, uh, this, this hereditary musician playing Drippet on the harpsichord. Um, and so keen on the harpsichord was he that he gives the date of his manuscript as a chronogram, where all the syllables add up to the Christian era date 1788 in such a way that he both demonstrates his new notation system and his knowledge of European instruments. Some of you will have heard me do this before, but this is the chronogram on the right hand side. Tanana, 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 tanana. Flute, harp, violin, fife, organ, harpsichord, which I think is quite brilliant. So, Rasparas Khan, going back to Rasparas Khan, had two sons, one of whom, Anjabaras Khan, maintained prominence at the court of Muhammad Shah as a second Tan Sein and the Emperor's Ustad. He was just unlucky to be eclipsed in his lifetime by a musical genius, Niamat Khan Sadarang, second only to Tan Sen in Hindustani musical legend. It appears that Sadarang did not have any suitably proficient musical sons. He famously took on his brother's son, Firoz Khan Adarang, as his special shagird. But he did have a daughter who he married to Anjaparas Khan in a dynastic arrangement that then, as now, would have acted to preserve the longevity of the traditions of both families. The other way to do this in the genealogy was to teach male members of the wider family who were not direct descendants. One of these was Karim Khan, who was in the Khan Sen line, but it's not entirely clear how. He was taken on by Adarang as his dis special disciple. Karim Khan's son was the most prolific and interesting author of the lot. Khushal Khan Anup wrote at least four significant works of musical scholarship in Hyderabad. The Brajpasha Rag Darshan of 1800, written for the Maratha general Rajarao Rampa Bahadur. The Persian Rag Darshan of 1808, written for Nizam Sikandarjah Asafjah III of Hyderabad. And a mixed Persian and Brajpasha Rag Darshan of 1815, written for the great Hyderabadi courtesan Malakabai Chanda. And finally, a massive collection of the repertoire of his lineage. The Rag Ragni Rosa Shab 
compiled between 1818 and 1834, which although not a music treatise is nonetheless a vitally important compendium of musical knowledge. Um, and there are at least 2000 songs in there. Um, and um, uh, Chanda Shekhar, Professor Shekhar has uh, produced um, a very fine edition of uh, the Persian Rav Darshans uh, recently. By the first decades of the 19th century, Anup was a senior musician at the court of Hyderabad, but he arrived earlier in the employ of Rajarao Rampa, a Maratha general in the Nizam's army. Apart from having been the ostad of the famous Hyderabadi courtesan Malaka Bhai Chanda, and having produced four vast works of musical scholarship, just demonstrating his mastery of Persian, Brajbhasha, and several other North Indian vernaculars, he died wealthy and was buried at the most important Shia shrine of Hyderabad, Mullah Ali Darga, whose most important buildings were funded by his donation, or some of them. As we see here, his Brajpasha Rag Darshan includes not only a written genealogy of both sides of his lineage, but interestingly also a visual one. And I, these are the only 18th century paintings I know of, um, of Sadarang at the top right, and Adarang top center in black. Moreover, the written genealogy includes an early reference to the Kalawant Banis, or the peculiar styles attributed to different families in the Mughal court lineages, though Khushal Khan uses the word Jat rather than Bani. The Edinburgh Tal treatise uses Bani. Khushal Khan refers to the family of Sadarang as Kandari Jat, a statement that is confirmed in the later Asalallah Sul written in Delhi, which calls them the Kome Kalawanti Kandar. The book Khushal Khan is presenting to Raja Rao in this painting is thus highly significant. His works are the written embodiment of the Delhi Kalawant Birarari and its knowledge. His Prajpasha and Persian Rag Darshans are works of music theory and both of them are palimpsests of the canonical Mughal treatise on Hindustani music par excellence, the fifth chapter of Mirza Khan's Tufad al-Hind, written for Mughal Prince Muhammad Azam Shah in about 1675, so a good 125 years before this was written. His first fully Braj Pasha, Rak Darshan, is therefore the most interesting because it constitutes the reception into an Indian vernacular language of a Persian work that was itself a distillation of all the theory fit to know from Sanskrit written traditions, specifically Damodara's Sangeeta Darpana, combined with Persian interest in contemporary practice. So we've got lots and lots of uh, things coming into this, this mix here. Hushal Khan's song collection is likewise designed to document and to valorize the musical and literary traditions of the Delhi Kalawant Bharatari. His collection both validates the song compositions of his ancestors and at the same time authenticates them through his physical person and his presence at the Hyderabad court and innovates within the tradition by including several of his own compositions that he wrote for patrons in Hyderabad. This draws early 19th century Hyderabad and its courtly musical traditions firmly into the imagined sovereign space of the Mughal court in Delhi, but it also represents the authoritative Mughal repertoire of the Delhi court embodied in its lineal musicians and now in written form for the very first time. And this is a droppid composition written by Firoz Khan Adare. Hushal Khan's reference to the lineage of Sadarang and Adarang as constituting the Kandari Bani connects it to another remarkable and wholly original treatise on Tal, the Asala Lasul from the early 19th century, written in Persian in Delhi by Muhammad Nasir Muhammadi Ranj in conjunction with the blind musician Mian Himmat Khan. The introduction to this treatise lays out in parallel the lineages of the authors, Muhammad Nasir Muhammadi Ranj, grandson of Sufi leader and esteemed poet Khaja Mirdard and Sajjada Nasheen of his grandfather's shrine in Delhi at the time, and Mian Himmat Khan, the great nephew of Sadarang, who rose to stardom at the court of Shah Alam, who reigned from 1759 to 1806. And he had recently passed away when Sayyid Ahmad Khan wrote about him 
in the Asar of Sanadid of 1847, and he passed away as the venerable chief Galawant of Bahadur Shah Zafar's court. Hemat Khan was already blind by the time famous Eurasian resident of Delhi, James Skinner, commissioned this painting of him in about 1825. And he entrusted the secrets of his musical lineage to be monumentalized in written form to the current head of a Sufi lineage that had over the past three generations enjoyed a close and entangled relationship of mutual Ustad Shagirdi and Pimuridi with his own lineage, Nasir Muhammadi Ranj. This text comprehensively lays out the PAL systems in use by both Galawans and Kavals using a highly readable practical notation system similar to the one found in the Edinburgh Tile Treatise. And again, drawing on Arabic prosodic and metrical models, and you can see um, an example here. It's clear from the simple but informative diagrams that accompany each tile that the tile system in use in Delhi by the early 19th century was very close to our modern conception of tile. Our final authors testify to the movement of the literate Delhi tradition to Lucknow and beyond, beyond 1857, to Metya and Calcutta. We've long known that some Delhi Galawans moved to Lucknow in the reign of Asaf Uddola. Chief amongst these must have been the Galawant that the Lucknow author of the Nahmai Andalib reported to be Firoz Khan Adarang's son, Mian Chaju Khan, singer, whose son in turn, Basit Khan, a Rabab player, flourished under Vajid Ali Shah and by some accounts was the last Nawab's Rabab Ustad. When going into exile with Vajid Ali Shah in 1856, Basit Khan hurriedly commissioned copies of three treatises to take with him. He apparently seems to have left without them as they were sent to him as he traveled down the river into Bihar towards the colonial capital. They were and this should be no surprise now. A copy of the Shams al Asfat, a copy of the Usul al Nagmat al Asafi, and a copy of the mysteriously popular Sanki Sarawali, which very closely resembles the kinds of skeleton notes that Dr. Ranade described being in the possession today of many literate Ustads. After Basit Khan left Lucknow in 1856, he took an Afghan Sarod player, Niamatullah Khan, as his disciple in the Kalawanti technique of Indian Rabab. Niamatullah Khan had two sons, Karamatullah Khan and Asadullah, known as Kokab, both of whom were renowned in their lifetimes as knowledgeable experts on Hindustani music, literate in several relevant languages, including in Karamatullah's case, at least Arabic and English. The work that Karamatullah gave to Bhakande was the Israri Karamat Urf Nagmati Niamat, published in Allahabad in 1908 in Urdu. It is a tour de force of wide ranging musical scholarship, drawing on the Indic Persianate traditions of his forefathers, but also introducing new ideas from Arabic and even Western theory. And uh, Max Katz has written very eloquently about this in his book, Lineage of Loss. Karamatullah's brother's unpublished work of 1915, the Johari Muziki of written in Urdu, uh, also in Calcutta, is of similar quality and was clearly intended for publication. The latter explicitly cites several works of musical literature within Kokab's lineage's intellectual genealogy as sources for his new work, including the Tofat al Hind. Uh, and here in the boxes, we have lists of uh, the sources that uh, these authors drew upon. Um, so, and the Tofan al Hind is in both of them. In short, what we have in this set of networked uh, Kalawans is a hereditary lineage of distinguished practitioners. In fact, the most authoritative lineage of practitioners connected with the Mughal court before 1857, combined with a genealogy of highly erudite musical scholarship in full dialogue with the wider music theoretical discourse of North India. The lineage of the chief musicians to the Mughal emperors was a lineage of literate Ustads, traceable through written records as both 
professional practitioners of great distinction and as writers of music theory from the time of Shah Jahan to the time of Gandhi. After presenting his book to Pakhande, Karamatullah tried to engage him in musicological discussion of an obscure point of Sanskrit theory pertaining to the Shrutis or microtones of the Hindustani scale and how they mapped onto current practice. What have you decided about Tivra, Ati Tivra and Ati Komal Swaras? asked Khoshal. So not Khoshal, Karamatullah. Khan Saab, you must have addressed all of this in the book you wrote. Yes, I have. Which text did you use as authoritative for your work or did you just write whatever came into your head? Of course not. How could I have written without textual authority? Tell me the name of one Sanskrit text, if you can, so that we can then talk about that text. What is the need for a Sanskrit text? Why only Sanskrit? It's not as if there are not many other texts. I've thought carefully about a lot of them before writing my own. Were there texts in Sanskrit or Prakrit? No, what is wrong with reading in Arabic and Persian? There are no lack of texts there. Kansa, which is this book? Can you tell me its name and year? Was it Sarmai Ishrat? Uh, which is in fact an Urdu treatise, um, which also is incidentally in the Delhi tradition, um, published for the first time in 1869. No, no, that is not the book I, I mean. This is re that's a recent book. I'm talking about books going back hundreds of years, one of which is the Tofat al-Hind, a very important work. At this last oblivious appeal to a non-Sanskritic textual authority, Bhatkanda finally lost his patience and dismissed Karamatullah as a fool and a fabricator. But it was, in fact, Bhatkanda who was wrong about the tradition in this discussion. For Karamatullah Khan's book shows him to have been one of the last custodians of a major river system of Shastric knowledge that had flowed continuously from the late 16th century down to that very day, preserved not in Sanskrit, though it drank deep from Sanskritic wellsprings, but in North India's early modern languages of command and high culture, Persian, Brajapasha, and latterly, after 1857, Urdu. Karamatullah naturally assumed that a great pundit like Patkande would have recognized these writings as the vital supports of musical knowledge that they were through the dark days of Mughal decline and British ascendance. But Patkande neither knew nor valued them, nor cared to understand their critical historical importance. The two men were talking past one another in mutual incomprehension, and as the voices of Bhatkande and other Sanskritists grew louder in the debates on music reform over the next few decades, the voices of those other streams were gradually drowned out. In the intervening hundred years between then and now, even our memories of the deep and rich streams of writing on Hindustani music in Persian and Prajpasha have largely dried up. But the many texts musicians wrote still remain in the archives where we can still read them and here again, if only faintly, the voices of those hereditary ustads long passed into silence. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Schofield, for that absolutely fascinating and riveting lecture. Um, yes, everybody is applauding. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. I, per I particularly found it fascinating that an Indian mu musician uh, made that observation about the harpsichord. Oh, uh, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, sorry, keep going. Sorry, yeah. sorry so go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I know I, I was I was going to say it's really interesting because um because at exactly the same time there were um uh you know English musicians, like people like Joseph Folk, who were comparing the the yes. in with the harpsichord, yes. and they were making similar exactly. kind of comparisons and saying, well, yes. it's tuned the same way that the harpsichord is. They have the same semitones yes. that we do. Um, and yes. of course, harpsichords would have been tuned not to equal temperament at that time, but to you know various mm -hmm. forms of Pythagorean and just intonation. And so, so it's absolutely, it's really, it's a really, it's it's, it's a precious little moment that one. Absolutely. And maybe some Indians will take pride in the fact that now uh, we can say that ethnomusicology actually emerged from India. Oh, absolutely. 
<laughs> so I had a few questions and then we'll take uh, some from the chat window. Uh, do you think many hereditary musicians in succeeding generations down to our times were and are aware of the texts you refer to, which some of which uh, may have been written by their ancestors? Yeah, so um, I was incredibly privileged to be given the copies of um, not 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 you know gifted but but shown the copies of Basit Khan's treatises that he had written out for him, along with Karamatullah Khan's um, and Koko Khan's treatises by their descendant um, Ustad Irfan Muhammad Khan yes. uh, in Kolkata. Yes. Um, who is himself a literate Ustad and 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 literate in Persian still as Absolutely. well as Persian. so that so that literate lineage comes through um, and um, and that was just an enormous an enormous privilege but there is also um, so uh, Professor Shekhar when he did his edition of um, the Rag Darshan of Hushal Khan and Oops, you know great treatise um, one of the copies had belonged to the great Ustad Fayez Khan um, and, and been in his family. And it was given to Professor Mehta, who'd then given it to, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a chain of, um, you know, chain of commands. Yes, yes. <laughs> but but uh -huh. it's clear that, that he treasured that in his, in his uh, lineage. Um, but there's also just, there's just things that, um, you know, that musicians say some of the time. I'm thinking particularly, um, Ustad uh, Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan, the great Kaval, when he was yeah. still alive. And this was um, long before there were any published copies of the Rag Darpan. And he would um, quote things from the Rag Darpan. So either they'd been, you know, sort of passed down orally, you know, in his, you know, in his silsila, or he'd actually read it and, and memorized it. So, so there's, and, and uh, Dr. Ranade, of course, himself said that lots of musicians actually have these writings, but they, they, they keep them secret because they actually are the treasures of their houses. Um, yes. so, so I think, I think it does depend quite a bit on, on who the musicians were though. And one of the interesting things, and I, I hope nobody will, will um, get offended by this. <laughs> None of my- Doesn't music. matter. <laughs> colleagues in 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 the west so, so i i i i hate the word of the musicology and i don't consider myself one i'm a historian um uh, but but um the it's really interesting how many of the early anthropological field work done on karana was actually done on sarangi players mm. and and a lot of sarangi players don't use writing um, that's not to say that they are functionally illiterate, but they don't, they really don't use writing. And I wonder how much of that affected our understanding. Um, but there is also the fact that people stopped being able to read Persian basically after 1857 and Braj they, they They really, you know, that, that knowledge kind of died out. And then you have the tumult of 1947 um, and so, and the, the great split there. So, um, so a lot of things have been lost um, thanks to uh, thanks to the British Raj, um, which which is very unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think uh, Bundu Khasab left behind a, a notebook. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. And of course, and yes. of course, um, Ustad Ali Khan wrote his memoirs. And yes. Um, and um, Malka Pukraj. Yes. Right. Hers, absolutely and yeah. you know and and, and she was provide and we i mean we expect our vibes to be literate of course mm. um uh yes and um right. yeah and, and somebody mentioned me and ahmad yes of course so he's he survives 1857 as well um and uh, and thankfully because he's rescued um and um and his traditions continue so um so that's actually really important um in punjab yeah fantastic uh I was particularly interested uh, um, about this aspect because, for instance, uh, a more recent work, um, I mean, published in the 1960s, I think, uh, uh, by uh, written by Vilayat Hussain Khasab, mm, yeah. <clears throat> which yeah. contains uh, genealogies and descriptions of various ustads from various regions of northern India. Uh, many a time I find that uh, there's no mention of some of those musicians or authors you have 
uh, spoken about yeah. uh, and certainly not about the works that you've uh, spoken about. And um, of course, Vilatu Sen Khasab says that uh, his account about all these uh, you know, oral histories is, is, is from his seniors and other uh, Ustads he had interacted with. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether uh, there was some sort of missing, uh, you know. Yeah. So, so this, so this is this is the this is the the, the thing that 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 all all tazkiras, all genealogies, um, all sort of anecdotes are not necessarily self-serving, but they serve the Qurana. And um, one thing that's really important to, to to note is that even if you have a genealogy that's written down, and you can actually, so I've I've kind of looked at a number of texts and tried to make sense of the connections um, over a sort of 150 year period. Even when you can piece that together, there's still things that, that don't add up. And especially when you start looking at materials produced in Lucknow versus materials produced in Delhi. Um, and so in Lucknow slightly later, they're getting things wrong. They're actually getting mm. things wrong. Things that are actually really clear from all the Delhi writings in Lucknow, they're actually getting them wrong. Um, okay. and possibly in part to kind of push up the prestige of um, of their own Kalawant musicians who were perhaps from junior branches or perhaps not actually Kalawants, they might've been buddies and came to Lucknow yes. and pretended to be Kalawants, which was really common. Um, you know, and there's there's things like, so the identity of Mian Chaju Khan is really obscure. There is one reference to him having been the son of Firoz Khan Adarang, but it's an unusual word for son. It's more like sort of male, male offspring, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it, I I don't know. So so that connection's a bit bizarre. The other thing is is that you know, this is this is just one lineage. There are so many lineages that will be pre preserved in the oral memory that are absolutely as accurate as the you know written ones. Right. Um, similarly, self-serving. But um, but they're as accurate. It, it, they just tell a different story. It's you know as the the Tanzen uh, Bandish says, you know, music is an endless ocean of which I could only ever drink one drop. Um, yes. You know, it's a little bit like you know, these these are little tiny tiny little little streams, and and perhaps you know other streams don't necessarily know about them, or they don't quite connect up somehow, or something's been you know sort of left out somewhere. So so um, I think all of these things are as basically as accurate as... <laughs> right. Uh, a couple more questions from my side and then I'll take some from the from the audience. Um, so how many of these uh, you have mentioned about Kalavans writing these oh. texts, uh, but do you find uh, many texts written by, let's say, Sarangi players or Tabla players or Pakavaj players? And uh, what are those accounts like? Yeah, so not un not until the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. So you get so you get things like Gurudev Padwardhan's um, great yes. on Pabla, for example. Yes. Um, yes. But before that, not really. Um, which doesn't necessarily, you know, sort of mean anything. It's just that we don't have them. I mean, it's you know, it's quite possible that that they existed, and you know, we we're just left with. You know, it's whatever posterity has bestowed upon us. Um, you know, we don't have everything. Lots of things burnt. Lots of things, you know, were destroyed. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a little bit harder to to kind of pin those things down. And and the authors who are writing about Thal, um, including writing about uh, Tabla, about um, about Pekka, about Pakawaj, um, are singers. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah, there's a really so there's a really important text which I actually need to get my head around, which I've been working on largely because Jim Kippen is working on it. Um, yes. And um, which which was by a, um, a apparently a Sufi saint, a Khaja Modudi Chishi, and about whom I know very little. I mm. you can't find anything, and he and. He actually influences Ghulam Raza's writing on Tal in the Usul al Nakhmat al Asafi. There's some suggestion that he actually reads it. Um, so there's all there's all sorts of people who are writing on Tal who are apart from uh, apart from Mian Khan are obscure. Mm. 
Yeah, I, actually, uh, Jim Kippen did uh, mention a few of uh, um, uh, the things that you mentioned about Pakavaj when he did a lecture here for uh, for Bombay audiences. Uh, <clears throat> one more thing about since we're talking about genealogies, and, and this may be a little tricky, uh, but uh, everybody in, in virtually all uh, biodata uh, material that we find today uh, everybody harks back to Tansen. And so, uh, yes, and uh, so, and across Gharanas. Uh, so, in your study of genealogies as well, uh, how true do you think, or, or are there multiple layers? Uh, what do you feel? Uh, that's super tricky. <laughs> yes. Shall because... we go to the next question? <laughs> Because it's, I mean, it's, it's undoubtedly the case that that um, that Tan Sen's repertoire gets passed down, and then it actually, because it gets written down, it gets it, it gets, um, uh, and not just and not just by Khushal Khan Anoop. There's a whole pile of song collections that appear between 1770 and 1830, which write these things down. Right. So, um, so they are they're clearly being sung a great deal more widely um than um you know one might think of hereditary property and i i, I think yes. we i think you know we need to not really sort of think about it in those terms um the direct line so the line to anjaparas khan and his sons um kind of fizzles out because anjaparas um this is one of the chapters of my book um was far better known as a teacher than as a performer. And so he was, he basically the baton passes to the Sadarang lineage, to the mm. Kandarani, who are not directly descended from Tan Sen, but because yes. there was this dynastic marriage. Marriage, the middle, yes, yes. Right, they are. So they're all, they're all, they're all intermarried. I think that's actually an, a really important point. This is how they preserved their lineages through the tumult of the middle of the 18th century when as you know, custodians oh, yeah, yes you you, yeah. you 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 teach people who are not related to you and you adopt them you you, you adopt them as 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 sons slash apprentice apprentices you teach your nephews um you marry your daughters to other lineages and so it all basically becomes one i think i i I think that's probably <laughs> probably the answer, but I mean it's it's you know why aren't why aren't why aren't people you know drawing their you know lineages back to um, the other great Galawans who were at Akbar's court you know yes, because yes. they're several. Um, yes. I think it's, well yeah. uh, uh, the the Agra Gharana does do that uh, for one, and and yeah. um, I think um, Aladia Hasab's. Uh, tradition also does do yeah. that. Um, but in general, and especially the instrumentalists uh, yeah. keep ha having the senior prefix yeah. to whatever else it's connected to. Yeah. So I, I was trying to understand that. So I think with that, I think that's a, that is actually a connection to the, to the, to Bean and, and Drupad Rabab. Rabab, yes. So those musicians who come from Bean and Drupad Rabab families, that was the preserve of mm. the Kalam. It absolutely right. was. And right. um, although, as we've seen, um, Anjabaras Khan taught Mehan Muhammad Panar Kaval the bean. And we have these distinguished traditions of, of Sufi bean players who, who are, you know, and Kaval bean players. So it, wow. it gets really messy in the 18th yeah. century because they're trying to keep things alive. They're trying not to, mm. to let die in a situation where everything is just scattering all over the place and you know if 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 um you know alabanda the great kaval you know dies of cholera you know when saftar jang is sacking delhi in 1753 and you know um I mean, there's, there's all sorts of hor horrible stories so i had a couple more questions uh did musicians uh refer to musical forms other than their own did these forms include those uh, that would be associated with folk music and dance 
And did they also refer to arts like poetry and painting? And if so, in what context? Did they see music making as a part of a composite artistic tradition or did they see it in a vacuum? Yeah, this is a really great question. So I think one one of the things that um, that um, I've, I I and a number of people have been trying to get away from is is, is using the word, word classical and using the word rag based instead. So rag based repertoire because um, a lot of the rag based repertoire um, we would not recognise today necessarily as being classical. So you get kirtans, for example, which are sung in rag, yes. beautifully sung in rag, yes. which. Yes. Uh, considered devotional, they're not considered classical. Similarly with Qawwali, you know, it's not considered classical, considered devotional, but it's still in rag, right? Um, and so and so that actually opens up a kind of a fluidity between genres. There were certainly genres that were considered to be more elite than others. So, dripped, khayal, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, tappa, um, uh, later tumri, but nonetheless, you know, and, and you know, uh, Amiris shouldn't listen to Bhantamasha because that is, you know, uh, yeah, that's that's just, that's of the bizarre. It's bizarre. All right. Uh, so <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> but they, right. did anyway. they did anyway. So, you know, they, we, we have accounts of um, Akbar Shah, the, you know, the, the um, Bahadur Shah Zafar's father, you know, watching the puns um, from the top of the Zafar Mahal in uh, Mehrawli and, you know, enjoying it and, you know, giving them, you know, uh, a, a token seven or 11 rupees of the auspicious amount. Mm. So, so um, yeah, so they do, they do talk about other genres. Um, uh, if you're looking at song collections, um, they include, um, there's, there's a, it's, it's, it's actually quite a limited set of repertoire that they include. Uh, in the rag based song, um, it's it's the th it's what you would expect basically. It's you know sort of dripped hori damar um, and other dripped related things. Um, um, stut. Um, no khayals. And khayal, you know, so under under separate separate category, uh, khayal, tapa, um, ghazal, um, and Tumri. all um no tomri's later so so there are collections of tomri's but they're later so it, it really there is a there is a tomri tal in the asala lasul which um which um is about 1815 something like that um where the author says well it's all the rage in delhi right now <laughs> tomri so tomri is a 19th so anything before that won't have tomri in it but right. yes it's quite, yeah yeah so we have two questions here one from Sumana. Sumana, you want to go ahead? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Sumana, hi. Uh, thank you so much. It was really, I mean, it was really insightful and I'm really looking forward to your book. So um, I'm a journalist and a, a literary curator and I also learn Hindustani vocal music and I've been learning for quite a bit of time. I um, have a question actually on, on the uh, not specifically on texts written by Ustad, but on identity and the premise um, of the lecture to some extent. And uh, um, it's kind of a fundamental question, which is that when we talk about hereditary musicians, we sort of assume they're all Muslim mm. in culture. Mm. And uh, why is that? And, uh, and are there, were there Hindu hereditary lineages? Which were they? And related to identity is the question of, um, you know, a kind of a syncretic identity. And I ask this because my first uh, guru learned from Ajmat Hussain Khan. And uh, he used to teach us compositions by Zahur Khan, whose, uh, you know, uh, pl Norm the Plume was uh, um, uh, Ram Das. Mm. And so he had converted and he knew Sanskrit, he knew Persian, you know, so, so this I, I think Munas Faruqi and Vasudra Dalmia have written uh, something about that, but I was just wondering if you could also point to any uh, your writing or other writing on this kind of inter indeterminate identity, yeah. like you could be a Muslim and a Hindu at the same time, is the impression yeah. I get, yeah. and if there are any kind of scholarly work on that. Yeah, so so this is absolutely the case, and um, and I'm 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 still uh, writing the introduction to my book, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick that in there. This is a this is thank you for the for a reminder because, um, you know one one of the things that happens uh, it's 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 quite so it's a it's quite a complex answer. The first answer is that literally nobody cared 
uh, whether musicians were Muslim or Hindu or, or, or what their sectarian identity was. Nobody cared about the musicians' own identity because they were servants, right? They were of lower status than their patrons. All that mattered was that they served what their patrons wanted. And that's why you have drupids which are to Muna Jinshishti and you have drupids that are to Lord Shiv um, and you have khayals that are to um, uh, Lord Krishna and you have khayals that are uh, Sufi. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's really because actually nobody cared <laughs> what the identity of the musician was. And they, and they had very flexible identities too. So you have this thing where you actually can't necessarily tell what um, identity somebody is because they have both a Muslim name and they have um, a Braj Bhasha chop. So, um, so you have Khushal Khan Gunasamudra, right? Tan Sen, we actually don't know what his name was. Tan Sen is his chop. We don't know what his name was. Nobody knows. Um, what we, what, what, so there were, it, it is the case that the vast number of Kalawans in North India, in Mughal North India, um, and a lot of the Tawaifs as well were Muslim. Um, and in, 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 in their adherence, um, but again, very, very flexibly. So we, we, we misunderstand if, if, if um, you know, if we, if we put too hard and fast a rule on it. So, so um, with the family of um, Sabarang, Adarang, uh, their brothers and, um, and their descendants beyond Himmat Khan and so on, we know that they were um, very close adherents of the, um, the Naqshbandi Mujadidi, um, uh, Tariq Muhammadi of Khajamir Dard. Um, and that's very well documented. Um, but there were hereditary um, Hindu um, lineages. So Bakavach players were all Hindu, which is really interesting. And I don't know why um, there's this, it's, 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 it's very, very clear. So you have lots and lots of Muslim, you know, Galawans, lots of Muslim Taris, lots of Muslim Kabals, and then you have the Bakavach players who are all Hindu um, and Brahmin. Oh. Is yeah. it because they were playing in the temple tradition? Uh, it's a really good question, and 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 the answer is probably. Um, yeah. But again, we don't really know. Um, Although, uh, uh, Dr. Schofield, uh, I remember reading your paper uh, in which you you have spoken about the syncretic kind of uh, influences on Khayal, and yeah. uh, you've spoken about Vishnupad and. Uh, Perhaps if, if you could uh, um, just um, throw some light on that, so that might yeah. answer Sumana's yeah. question. So, yes. well, I just have, okay. okay, yeah, okay, you say this, then I just had a follow up question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, were they all Muslim musicians just as a, because under the Mughal period because it was like acculturation toward, towards the, the culture of the elite? It's a really good question. Nobody knows. <laughs> so, so, I mean, um, the yeah it's they so what 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 is the case is that um is that they um are hereditary poems um from at least the early 17th century onwards um we don't know about before that and actually they there were more um hindus like nakpakshu um in the early 16th century. So something happens in the 16th century, which is not necessarily related to the Mughals at all. Um, it could be related to, to, to Bhakti actually, um, and to, you know, the, the rise of Bhakti and Sufi religion. I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's the century of, of uh, Guru Nanak. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, there's something about the 16th century, but I'm sorry, I'm being super vague <laughs> mm -hmm. because nobody, no, nobody knows why. <laughs> Nobody knows right. what. Well. <laughs> There's a question uh, by Peter Lel. He says, thanks so much for the fascinating presentation. I have a brief question. What were the types of main sources you have used for your research? Iconographies, primary sources, secondary sources, notations? And how did you overcome the various language barriers? Thanks, Peter. Oh, yeah, I have, I've, been, um, I've been working on this material since... 1999 so over, over over 20 years now um and my sources are i mean there there is there is some iconography um but i work largely in persian 
um, and um, latterly in, in Urdu and Sampraj Pasha, um, which I'm really crap at. I have to apologize. And so I, you know, do get people to make sure that, <laughs> that I'm translating things properly. Um, but um, uh, music treatises, um, Tazkiras, so these, these, these biographies, historical chronicles, um, ethnographic materials, um, so things like Dargha Kuli Khan's Marak um, the Asura Sanadi by Sayyid Ahmad Khan, um, uh, what else? Um, weird things like, um, um, oh, I mean, of course, Ragamalas, um, but, but weird things like um, uh, books for um, administrators for, for munchies, where they, you know, teach you how to do um, Siak numerals and how to do accountancy and so on, and also teach you all about the ragas, and, which is weird. Um, uh, I've also um, recently done some work um, in the official East India Company archives, um, and uh, there's some really interesting material there, but it's restricted about, it's, it's fairly restricted it's a set of materials, um, of topics rather, um, because the official East India Company weren't interested really in music and musicians, only when they were, you know, rep, you know wrapped up in crime or anything to do with money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um yeah so it's, i mean so it's it's most of my work is primary source source uh research um and there's a lot of paintings as well so i do quite a lot of paintings um and yeah anything else that i can find and you know relying on my friends to uh point me in the right direction for anything in in uh Pasha particularly so Super. Uh, can we go to Srijan now? Uh, Question quickly is, is a little bit about genre, what you and Anish were talking about a minute ago, and also okay. your wonderful paper on the origins of Khyal, where you mentioned trace the history of it, Kavali and Shutkala, and all of these genres. Uh, which of these writers, are there any of these writers who are thinking about how the various genres, I mean, we, I get the sense that today we think of Drupad and Khyal as you know, very distinct from each other, and Ghazal is this and Kavali is that, but yeah. I, I get a sense from your writing that there was a time when the, the lines were very blurry between these genres. So is there someone who's commenting on how the genres are different from each other in terms of their formal principles? So is it Tal, is it Rag that makes them different, is it repertoire? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. So um, there are um, there are um, sources, I mean, it's not, not something I've done a great deal of work on, but there are, but there are sources that do say, in Drupad we do this and in, um, and in Khayal we do this. Um, and that's particularly to do with Alap and, and Tan um, and some of that material. There is material in um, the Sham Salasfat actually on, uh, you know, the, the, um, the syllables used in Alap and the fact that they're different from the syllables used in Tarana, which is associated with Khayal. So there, so there, so there, so there are um, sort of, Ravish, so, so so school differences, stylistic differences, um, which then I think become more hardened into um, into genre later. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 actually it is a really good question. I I mean it's it's probably what, what the, because the other thing that happens is that you you start getting people trained in the Drupa traditions, the Kalawans, singing in Khayal, and you get strange things like. Drupad's being cut down to be chaos, cut down into chaos. Right. Um, and so then, you know, there's a, you know, what, what does the, what's, what's the difference? And it's, and it's, and it's mostly, you know, one is combined with what they then call Tarana. The other is, is done with Alab. <sighs> yeah. And of course it's completely different now. It's very different now. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a good eye, eye opener for us as, mm, uh, students of oh, yeah. music today exactly. uh, that this kind of uh, you know of course there were hierarchies so yeah. we have to uh, uh, take that into account but at the same time there was a bit of openness as well yeah, so uh, we could lose the hierarchies and uh, make it more open without yeah. of course uh, diluting the uh, formal principles yeah. of uh, one or the other no, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I think there's always a distinction that's kind of drawn between the, the, the genres that are primarily about the rag and those that are about primarily about the words. So, um, uh, Fakirullah in, in 1666 makes this really interesting distinction about 
you know, different types of listeners. So, um, you know, there mm. are certain types of listeners for whom, you know, if you make, make a mistake in RAG, then, you know, that's absolute end, it's absolutely dreadful. But if you are listening to RAG and you're a Sufi and or a, or a, 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 a devotee and you're listening to it um, out of devotion, um, you, he says, you can you you can go into ecstasy at the sound of a water wheel. So it doesn't actually matter then if 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 that's if you're listening to it for those purposes, whether people make mistakes in rug. So, mm. you know, that's that's a quite interesting distinction. And there's another distinction. So I, I want to spend more time looking at the Asal Al-Asul actually, because um, because it really is very clear what the Karls were. But what he does is he separates them into. Um, Kalawan versions and Kaval versions yes. of the Tals. And the Kaval versions are always twice as long. Yes, another. The next one is from Priya Purushottaman, yes. uh, which says, uh, thank you for the insightful lecture, Professor Schofield. By the way, Catherine, there are a whole host of very, very appreciative comments, which I'm yes. going to the, the screen. I'm going to take a screenshot and send it to you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on the main difference in content between the Sanskrit texts and the Persian or Bridge Bhasha texts, particularly in the context of theories of sound and the nature of music. Yeah, that's a really great question. It and again, it depends on the text. So, the very best, my, in my opinion, the very best um, of the Persian translations of Sanskrit of a Sankhita Shastra is Mirza Roshan Zamir's 1666 translation of um, Ahobala's Sankhita Parajata. And what he does is he translates each shloka, literally, and then he does a paraphrase translation wow. uh, where, he, where he kind of basically says, this is what this means. And then he does a commentary. He does a Persian commentary on it. And very often he then includes uh, Doha, um, in Prashbasha, which explains the same thing, but is coming from the um, the oral tradition, and we know that his ustad was Hoshal Khan Gunasamudra, so the great grandson of Tansen in that chief musician line, um, and we also know that he was quite a distinguished Prashbasha poet himself. So, um, so he was an extremely, he was, he was clearly uh, fluent in Sanskrit, Prish Pasha and, and, and Persian, and that's an extremely fine example. Um, and so, in fact, what you have there is you have a great deal more information than just the Sanskrit text, um, because you have the commentary as well, and it's contemporary. Um, with others, um, they focus on certain certain things and not others, or they just kind of rattle off the standard stuff um, without explaining it, and then only explain the interesting stuff. So one of the really boring things about <laughs> about doing this work is the is is um, is the um, the chapters on swara <laughs> because they're always it's always the Sankita Ratnakara <laughs> mm. with. Very little, you know. Uh, do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. It's it's very it's, it's quite tedious. Um, and um, and so you get um, you get things like um, the Tofat al Hind is a fantastic example. So chapter five of the Tofat al Hind. The rest of the the Tofat al Hind is is on um, Indian arts basically. It's it's a it's the first grammar of Prashpasha. Um and there's a great. Uh, glossary at the end of various Prashpasha terms, which is really useful for music research. Um, there's a, you know, a, a chapter on Kokashastra, there's a, 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 a chapter on Nayakabhed, and of course there's the chapter on music, which is very long, um, and it's almost entirely derivative of various other works, particularly the Sangeeta Dharapana as it's, as, it's, as it's kind of come in. But again, he really only focuses on the bits that are interesting to him. Um, so, um, yeah, so in, in other words, it, it, it really does depend. Sometimes you get things where um, they cite Sanskrit and it's, um, and it's completely garbled and it's impossible to tell probably what it is anyway in Persian script. Um, and it's a little bit like Sanskrit is the authority, but it's a, an authority 
in the, these particular texts in a kind of a supernatural way. Um, so you, you actually, you have to have Sanskrit knowledge, um, but you perhaps actually really don't understand it at all. So you're just putting in a, a shloka that somebody said to you and you didn't really understand it properly at all, but you know, that's what you heard. <laughs> and it's a, yeah, there's a, I can't remember who talked about, the, I think it might've been Chris Shackle who talked about the phenomenon of what he called Sahaskriti, which is um, completely garbled Sanskrit in other um, languages. <laughs> Uh, there's one from Anjali Malkar. She says, excellent lecture. Thanks. My question is, was Tanpura in vogue during the Tansen period? Uh, so we have evidence of the West Asian Tambur, which is fretted, being used as a drone from the late 16th century in paintings. So being held and being played. So yes, is the answer. Short answer. Yeah. <laughs> then this is another one. There's one by Adrian McNeil, but he says a really terrific and beautifully delivered paper. Thoroughly enjoyed the clarity and substance of your talk. Looking forward to reading the new book. Thank you. Just had a brief question. Hereditary ness seems to offer some particular challenges. Do you think we can talk about hierarchies of hereditary ness? Yes. The there were a large number of hereditary communities and they are clearly viewed in the Mughal periods by both, um, but by all, all sorts of people, Mughals, Rajputs, Europeans, as existing in a hierarchy. So you have hereditary Kalawans who are at the top of the hierarchy. You have Kavals who are basically similar in, in, in hierarchy, but you know different from the Kalawans. Hadis and Marasis are very definitely further down. But then, you know, in Rajasthan, they have a particular ritual importance. Um, and then you get communities of things like Bazigars and um, Nats and, you know, various kind of conjurers and acrobats and so on who use music and, and, and dance, Bans, Bharupias, who are also hereditary. And they're also regarded as being, you know, uh, vulgar, common. Um, <laughs> so there, so, so there, is, there, is a, there is a hierarchy there, definitely. There's a slightly heavy one from Saroja Ganapati. She says, I think scholarship on music's past has reached a point where a lot of unpacking has to be done from within its own conventions. We ask questions arising out of our own academic lineages and find it hard to step out of these when we encounter new archives. Yeah. Music and writing on music keep challenging these frameworks, don't they? Wondering if you had such critical moments during your research and what these could have been. Wow. Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, and I think for me, it's things like um, different languages because I'm working um, in all, for the Mughal stuff, I'm working almost entirely in Persian. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, uh, a little bit in Urdu. Um, and what's been really exciting to me is seeing my ex-PhD student who works in Prajpasha and Mithili and all sorts of um, early modern and late medieval vernacular languages find this entire new archive of musicological sources from the early 17th century that completely turn upside down some of my own work. And actually that's really, that's really exciting to me to, to, to see that because I can't read it. I didn't know it existed. He found it and it says, basically it tells us that Sanskrit Sangeeta Shastra moved first into Prajapasha and then into Persian. As and it became a kind of intermediary language for the Mughals because the Mughals actually understood Prajpasha rather than, and they didn't understand Sanskrit. Um, and it was really important. And I would have not have seen that, um, you know, had it not been for, you know, my student who was working in that language. Is, you know, similarly, um, you know, it's, I, I've, I've worked a lot on men. So because all the texts that I read, uh, by men and so I talk about the the methyl or the majlis um as it was called then um in in male terms and then my lovely art historian friend Molly Aitken says yes but what about all the paintings of women's majlises and it's like what <laughs> mm -hmm. and once you start looking they're everywhere 
Um, similarly with male dancers, if you're looking all the time at the life, you miss the fact that there are just so many paintings where you have male dancers. Right? And even women percussionists. Yes, and women percussionists. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, it, it's, it's, we do all come at this stuff with massive blinkers on. And I think that's really important. You know, I was, I was critical of Pat Candice blinkers, but I have them. And it's, and it's really necessary to, to point that out. So, you know, that's a really brilliant and, and in, indeed a very deep question. Thank you. Uh, Kedarnath Auti, who's a formidable Western classical musician and a scholar in his own right, and a genius mathematician, Catherine. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> done his PhD with, at Buffalo University. Uh, he asks, uh, were there, and, or I suppose, was there an interest in tuning in the Persian texts? and practical suggestions. Around that time in Europe, the methods of tuning were constantly changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so one of the things I worked on in my PhD and which was, I, I had to work out all the string fractions for, for the tuning systems in, um, in the 17th century treatises. So they, yes, they, they started tuning using um, sort of, uh, Pythagorean proportions in the, sometime in the 17th century and it's in the Sanskrit and the Persian treatises. Um, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that was, that, that's as mathematical as I get. <laughs> uh, thank, you. thank you, Catherine, but it's just that it's not just mathematics, right? Because yeah. today when I sit and play, I play a simple Bach work and I always worry, yeah. damn it, is this what he intended? You know, mm. and, yeah. and it, 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 it's something that completely foxes me. So I was just wondering, yeah. Uh, with the, the 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 people in Delhi and in in probably in in Persia itself, the other small related question was when you notice the tunings in the dastagas of Iranian music, yeah, and rags of this thing. When I listen to dastagas, I see a lot of similarity. I see a yeah. much bigger difference between the Delhi and the Makam. But the yeah. dastagas seem to be so. Is am I just imagining it, or is this something real? No, it's real. As, and, and I mean, so the, you know, this, I do email me because, because there's a lot, there's a lot of really interesting things and I could get very, very in, um, into this <laughs> um, in, in, in terms of um, there is, so just one very small example of the relationship between the Iranian and the Indian systems in the 17th century. One of these um, people who write about the string fractions and, and, and you know, where to play, place the sweaters on the string includes a three quarter tone ray, which is quite obviously a, in, a, in a tart yes, called yes. Ghazal tart, right? <laughs> it's called Ghazal tart. And it's, and, it's, and it's clearly coming from Iranian maqams, um, and but it's for the bean. So, yeah. So there's there's, there's there's lots of these. Things. One particular note, which is common to both the Arabian and the Iranian, and we just don't find it at all in our yeah. system, which is yeah. the 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 super the, the super flattened third. Yeah. I was just wondering, how did we Indians who did everything else, how did we avoid that? You know, yeah, well, I, th I mean, I, th I do actually think that, unfortunately, the imposition of equal temperament um, has a big part to do with to do with this. Okay. Yeah. And, it, and it's the same for Western classical music as well. So I, I trained as a, as a violinist and a viola player and I went to conservatoire and everything. Um, and if you play in string quartets, right. Right. you tune to perfect fifths and you tune from from, you know, across yes. five perfect fifths. It's actually quite... And, and so the difference between, you know, an, an E on the, you know, C string and the, and the E string is actually quite a lot and you'd have to make adjustments, right? And, and so, so string quartet players always play, you know, with those perfect fifths, perfect fourths. When you actually have to then retune your mind to play with a piano, you actually have to adjust your, your, your tuning. And one of the things that, um, yeah, I, I, I could go on, I could go on. But let's 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 let everybody have a chance to speak. Yeah. With you. It was I, marvelous. Thank you so much. Oh, bless you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Keda. Dr. Schofield, you started with your uh, the the account uh, between Bhatkande. Uh, 
and uh, the, the hereditary musician. And I'm wondering whether that kind of polarization uh, continues to do to this day between uh, the practitioners of the art and um, people who are involved in, let's say, the theoretical part, or even people who are anthropologists or historians or whatever else, you know, and, and is there some meeting ground? Or yeah, is there that tension still? Yeah, I mean, I do, th I do think there is that 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 tension in particular, and I I sort of made a, a slight reference to it in that, you know, historians and anthropologists and musicologists and critics and connoisseurs and rustics uh, seek to speak for the tradition, yes. um, and, and to seek seek to speak for the for you know, performing musicians, and actually, the they then misrepresent and 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 always always misrepresent so and and it's simply you know because it's you know they are two different things i have so in my in my own life i have these two parts of myself which actually are not terribly well connected i have the performing side of me which doesn't get very much exercise right now um uh, with, you know violin viola jazz singing and you know at the moment all i do is sing to my son um, and then the other side of myself, which is the historian side of things, and they do come together in my work, but, you know, I'm not a practitioner of Hindustani music, right. um, although I have um, been a student of Hindustani music, I don't want to offend my Ustad by pretending that I'm any good. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, no, I do think there, there, there is misrepresentation and, 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 and we should be working together more often. That's the way to, to solve it. Thank you, Dr. Schofield, for this fantastic lecture, and it was really an eye-opener. I remember Dr. Ranade in this regard that he always uh, talked about uh, the categorization, he talked up opposite, eh? about the categorization or uh, hierarchy, and even uh, like being a practitioner and being a theoretician. Uh, he always um, emphasized on performers or practitioners uh, should write about their music making and why he was so resistant about that. Uh, it, it has uh, got clear with your lecture. And in a way, uh, in that sense, your lecture was really an uh, apt tribute to Dr. Ramadeh's memory. Uh, and especially when today we are compartmentalizing music on various grounds, like unnecessary grounds like religion and ethnicity, it's very important to point it out that uh, what was the actual history uh, which we are carrying forward. So thank you, Dr. Schofield, and I also thank uh, the participating listeners uh, for joining us today and uh, we will again meet next year for 11th Akrasadara.